Hey guys, welcome. This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. I've got David Dodge on with us and David is a really cool guy. You're going to like him. We're going to talk about what he's doing and uh, my microphone is really obnoxious right here. In the <laughs> so I'm going to move it up. But uh, how's that? Is that better? It's good. Anyway, hey, I just wanted to say uh, this is going to be a good podcast. I got, I'm glad to have David on. And uh, right now we're broadcasting live to Facebook. And so cool. everybody that is watching us right now on Facebook, you can type in the comments down below. We're also going to be publishing this later to the Real Estate Investing Mastery podcast. So um, I want to let you guys know that um, you can get the transcripts and the show notes. You can listen to this later at realestateinvestingmastery.com or you can go to reimpodcast.com and get all the show notes. And um, one more thing too, leave a review if you like this show. Even if you don't, come on, leave me a review. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to this at and uh, – let us hear from you. We'd love to hear from you, see what you like about the show, what you don't, and um, really, really appreciate it. So on today's podcast, we got David Dodge, and he is one of the most active investors and wholesalers in the St. Louis area. Um, I played a little part in getting him started uh, a while ago, four, four years ago or so, and uh, David is um, such a cool guy. Uh, and I wanted to welcome him to the show. David, how you doing, man? I'm well, Joe. Thanks for having me, man. Doing real good. Awesome. Uh, one of the things I like about you, David, so much is um, you're just a huge, massive action taker. And one of the things that I like to do with folks is give them a scorecard, help them create a marketing plan, give them a scorecard. And David was super aggressive with his scorecard when he first created it. And um, I remember it was like, wow, okay. Go for it, right? And he was only meeting about half of his numbers. But because he was making meeting just half of his numbers, he was actually getting more leads than he could handle. He was. And David was doing a ton of – I bet you that's a seller calling him right now. Isn't it? <laughs> it was, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's either a seller or an investor or a cash buyer lender. So, anyway, Dave just took off, and he's one of the biggest, most active wholesalers in the St. Louis area now. And works with a really cool team of people. And uh, David has his own podcast now, too. Just wrote a book. I, I should have brought the book with me. It's actually mm -hmm. in the other room. Um, David, welcome. How are you, man? I'm doing really good, Joe. I'm doing really good. And happy to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, and like you said, you paid a, you, you paid more than just a tiny part of getting me to where I'm at, Joe. You helped a lot more than you think. So I want to thank nice. you for that just directly. Um, Nice. But yeah, I, I remember those scorecards like it was yesterday when we had started. And in that program that I was in, I think it was an eight-week thing. Yeah. And uh, my goal, um, you know, my secondary goal was to do a deal. But my first goal was to beat everybody in the course. And I, I want to say I did, if not yeah. if two, not, if not three, or I had them teed up. If I hadn't closed them, um, it might have been one thing. But I had two, if not three deals that would – or would, you know, will or did close or would have closed. That's a better way to word it um, by the end yeah. of that, the end of that eight week program. So it was awesome, Joe. You taught me a ton. Here's the crazy thing about this, David, and you probably know this now that you're doing some coaching of your own. Mm -hmm. um, you get a lot of people that are excited and they sign up and they're like, I'm going to do it. And very few people actually do, right? Mm -hmm. Like what you're talking about is an accountability coaching thing that we do once in a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's discouraging. I'm going to be honest because like you get it out, you get signed, you get, we keep it small, like 12 people in a group and uh, everybody's excited. They're like, yes, I'm going to do it. We help them come up with a marketing plan. That's not crazy aggressive. It's just like simple. Right? Every day I'm going to do this and this and this, maybe three things. Right. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to talk to maybe three to five sellers a day, make three to five offers a day. That doesn't sound like a lot, right? Mm -mm. But every time I've done that, a kind of a group of coaching accountability thing, maybe, maybe 5% of the people that sign up finish it. So I'm one of the 5%. You're it's one good. of the 5%, maybe mm -hmm. 2%. Like, <laughs> right. I, I'm just like, what? I don't get it. So many people are, now I get it, man. Life gets in the way. It's hard. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. it sounds easy, right? At the beginning, David, like I'm mm -hmm. going to talk to five sellers a day. 
Yeah. And you know, Joe, I, I want to say this real quick. When I, when I, whenever I hired you and signed up for that accountability coaching program at the time I had like 60, I think it was 63,000 in credit card debt and um, was unemployed at the time. I met, always had little side gigs, little entrepreneurial businesses, but you know, no, no major job for the most part, no primary income. And um, I had paid you uh, for the program, but then you had also um, coached me and helped me into getting my first mail campaign out the door. So I was, I guess where I'm going with this is I was, I was vested pretty heavily in making it succeed because it wasn't like I was doing it after I got home from work or on the weekends. Essentially, when I sent that first mail campaign out, like between the time that that went out and the time that I started getting calls, 10 hours a day, I was just watching your course videos, reading other people's books, read your book, you know, all the above, just educating myself. So by the time that that phone started ringing, you know, I was like, what's the address? I'm on my way. You know, I wasn't even vetting deals at that point. I wasn't qualifying. But, you know, we had this conversation actually a couple days ago, me and my partner, Mike. You know, there's a fine line between qualifying. Now, it's different when you're doing lease options, of course, but our business is primary wholesale. We, we use the lease option strategy on the exit. And I don't, honestly, I don't think I've done a single lease option purchase. I've done some sub twos, but I've never done the lease option purchase, but I do that on the exit. But anyway, what I was getting at, though, is there's a fine line between qualifying somebody today and just going out and making a friend. Because if it's not a deal, you're kind of wasting your time. However, if you go make a friend and it becomes a deal two years later. So here's a funny thing. When I did those first letter campaigns, Joe, I had my cell phone on there because I just didn't ever think that that would be a problem. Yeah. Within three months, it was a problem. So I didn't, I got a different number, right? Um, but I still get people from the first three months of mail campaigns right. calling my cell phone. So there's three and a half, four year gap there, right? And a lot of it was because I had went out and I had met them and I had made a friend. So, so you know, everyone always says motivation changes and that's so true. However, it doesn't usually change in a week or two. It usually takes months, if not years. So one of the things I remember, it's all about relationships, right? And being that person that is accessible and available and answers the phone. Right. I remember you were, you know, I don't remember like specifically what, but you were going knocking on property managers doors, right? Yeah. That was the first, the first, uh, the first three deals I did was one seller. And that's how I found it. I was, I was calling, I wasn't necessarily knocking, but I was calling and emailing, you know, go to Google, type in property manager, your city. It's that simple. Find a list of 30 of them, 50 of them, send them an email and call them, you know, pick up the phone. Hey, I'm an investor in town. And at the time I owned a couple rentals. So I knew a little bit, I wasn't like a completely yeah. gr you know, green. I, I knew a little bit. And I just said, if you ever come across anybody that's looking to you know, sell one of their rentals, that's kind of what I was looking to buy as well. So I had a double edged sword there. Like if you have a good deal on a rental, I, I might be the buyer, but if not, I'll just lock it up and then wholesale that yeah. deal. So that was the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Get, getting on that phone. Joe, one about. of the, one of the, the, I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, but one of the best things that you did for me, I was telling this actually in a podcast the other day with Tom, with Tom Kroll. Um, one of the best things that you did to help me, and this may come off the wrong way, so you can't judge right away, but you literally told me that I wasn't allowed to ask you questions at one point in that, and so let me explain, because I was asking all these, pardon my language, but these dumbass questions about things that didn't matter. Like what if, you know, what if this happens in, in literally Joe, this, this is the, this is what the, the, the best nugget of gold that I had got from that in a single eight week pro, or, or that entire eight week program was David, you are not allowed to ask me any more questions until you have some appointments. <laughs> I and I was like, okay, I get it. Cause the questions were irrelevant. So then guess what happened? I went and did 10 appointments and then I Texter, I had used Boxer. I'm Boxer and Joe. Joe, I got appointments. What's next? And then you were like, great. And then you helped me along the way, but you literally kind of cut me off and I didn't take it personal. I'm like, I needed that. I needed someone to kind of say, quit worrying about all this yeah. BS stuff that could happen. Let's cross that bridge when it happens. I'm here to help you when it happens. And I use that exact same tool in my business today. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. 
Oh, uh, see, you guys see why I wanted David on the show. I pound that thing all the time. Like, stop asking what if, start asking what next. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, you mentioned you mentioned Tom it, Kroll. He talks a lot about anticipatory thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Stop that. Be careful. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say absolutely. You know, what happens when every year mindset is what if, what if, what if, analysis paralysis kicks in. It's just, it, that's just the natural flow of what if. It's like, well, you know, it, it prevents you from wanting to do the next thing. So like you said, Joe, you know, think about what next, not what if. And again, I don't want to say it like it came off negative because I didn't interpret it that way. And you weren't rude at all. You yeah. were just like, you were kind of laughing. I wish I had the message still, but you were like, David, I love all these questions. Cause I, at the time I was probably sending you three or four a day, you know, and uh, you know, that could be overwhelming on your end too. I get it. And you were just like, I love your, your motivation, but let's put that motivation to, to the, to the, to the pavement. Like let's, let's get it out there quit worrying. And that's really what was my biggest help yeah. hold up was just worrying. Well, what if I do it wrong? You know, and some of the best lessons and some of the best education that I've gotten over the last four years was just mistakes that I've made. And at the end of the day, nobody got hurt. And yeah, I may have made somebody angry at me for a day or two because it didn't fund right away or whatever the case is. But at the end of the day, everyone's happy. And I've done over 250, 300 deals at this point. That so, is so awesome. And isn't that crazy? So happy, man. Yeah, man. So, and we've got what, a book published. So what is your what does your business look like today? Let's talk about that. So right now, um, you know, we've kind of we've kind of scaled back a little bit on the wholesale because we're using the Burr strategy to acquire rentals. So we're still Burr. Doing, explain what that is, Burr. Sure. So Burr is B with a couple R's. And everyone does it a little differently. It could be four R's, could be six, but the way I look at it is you buy something, you rehab that property. Um, so buy, so buy rehab or renovate, and then you get it leased, which isn't necessarily part of the R. Um, and then you refi that property. So you get, you get all the money back. Like the goal would be all. And what we shoot for is less than 1500 because it doesn't always work where you can get all of your money back, but we've done 27 of them in the past 10 months, I'd say maybe a year, but I don't think it's quite a year. And some of them we've gotten, we've walked with money, but the goal for us is to, it's long-term wealth yeah. um, and then pay down. So we have a 12 year schedule to pay mm -hmm. down. And we, so the goal is to get to 150 uh, within That's the next three years. And then at the end of that three years, there's a 12 year goal that we have set to pay down 150 properties. There's three, myself and two partners. So that essentially would be 50 properties a piece. Oh, I love that. So give us an example of the numbers of a deal that you typically might want to do. Absolutely. So we really like, um, like Florissant, which is a North County suburb of St. Louis. Prices so, are around a hundred, 125,000, right? Yeah, exactly. hundred. That's exactly right. You're looking at ARVs. So the after repair value, or in this case, you're looking for the appraised value, which essentially is the ARV, but you got to go by the appraised value. And the banks will lend us anywhere from 70, well, 65% up to 80. And that really depends on a couple factors. It depends on like, you know, the neighborhood, if it's a good neighborhood, if there's high crime in there. Um, it actually does affect a little bit by like the size of the home, oddly enough. Um, and then just if the bank likes it, you know, so on and so forth. So what we want to do is we want to be all into that property for at a at the very most 80% of the appraisal, ideally 70% of the appraisal. All in after repairs, right? Correct. So we still have to buy the property, right? So let's walk you through the, a simple burst strategy deal. We find a property at let's say $60,000. So I need to find 60 grand. So luckily I have a, a five or six private lenders that I pay monthly interest payments anywhere from 10 to 12% annual. And they will lend me the 60000 that I would need to purchase it. However, that property may need $15,000 in repairs to get to occupancy so I can then lease it. And then also with the Burr strategy, this is something that most people don't mention, but because I'm doing it, I want to inform everybody. But with the Burr strategy, in order for the bank to give you what's considered the entrepreneurial credit, to where they will lend you 80%, but they don't require you to bring your own 20% in, 
you have to improve the property at least 10 to 15,000. Now that's, that's the two banks that we use. Every bank's gonna be a little different, but what they do in their terminology is they call it an entrepreneurial credit where they allow you to use the equity in the home as the down payment versus your skin in the game or cash brought to the table. So that's the huge game changer right there is not having to bring that 20%. So again, I'm gonna borrow 60,000 from a private lender to purchase it. And let's say in this scenario, it needs 15,000 work. I'm also gonna borrow that 15. So my loan to that private lender is really 75, not 60. So I purchased the property for 60, maybe 61, 61 and a half after closing costs. That leaves me, you know, roughly 15, a little less left. I take that, I put it into the property and get it, you know, nice updates, whatnot, and of course, occupancy ready. And then I have a property manager that's managing almost 45, 50 properties because company's got 27 and then I have uh, 10 or so of my own and my partner's got a couple. And then, um, so he does the leasing. And then as soon as it's leased, some banks will uh, they'll allow you to start the refi process right away. Um, however, I've found that the banks that don't have a seasoning period are going to have a higher rate. So we do, we kind of, you take these to different banks because we want to diversify amongst yeah. banks. We want to diversify our interest rates. And then we also want to diversify our term. So typically you're looking at a 20 year amortization on these commercial loans with a three year term. Now, this is something that, again, I didn't know before I went in and started doing the birth strategy, but these, these notes that you have with these banks, these commercial notes, they don't really balloon. They just are up for renewal, okay? So that's a huge difference because if you had to refi, your cost to do that every three to five years is gonna be 1,200 to two grand, maybe more. But with a renewal, it's typically like 50 to $100 fee and they may or may not even require an appraisal. It just depends. They basically do a BPO or a desk review. And anyone that doesn't necessarily look right to them, then they'll want to appraise. But most of them, they don't. So you renew, not refi, those loans in the burst strategy. So this is the perfect strategy, right? It doesn't always happen that way. But the coolest part is, is let's say I do a three-year term. And it's a 20-year amortization. Well, on the end of that three years, when I go to renew, my amortization starts at year four, not year one. And that's a huge difference. Really? If you don't know an amortization table, if you're watching or listening right now, and you want to be a real estate investor or even a wholesaler, I would spend an hour watching YouTube videos on how amortization tables work. And here's the, the, quick, the quick little bit. All of the interest is front loaded. Yeah. All of it. That's the way it works. So if you're starting on year four, versus year one again, you'll never have that house paid off. So what, Ideal, what, that, that in the first three years, where does the, where does the money go? Does it go to- so, in, so yeah, in the first three years on a 20 year, this is, I'm just throwing this from the hip is not exact, but like 90, between 92 and 96% of guessing um, of those payments is interest, right? right? The last three years of that 20 year term, 92, 90% of that payment percentage of that payment goes to principal. Right. So every year you're paying less interest and more principal. And it starts right. out at like 97 to three. And then, you know, year 19, it's three to 97. Right. So the bank gets all of their interest up front. And the reason that they do this is because the average person in America changes homes every seven to 10 years. So if yep. they're doing 30 year loans and you pay interest for seven years and then you sell that home, hopefully it appreciates, but it's, it's irrelevant because the bank's basically gotten, you know, one third, if not, if not up to like 40, 45% of all the interest they would have made on that entire 30 year loan. So it's definitely sure. in the interest of the bank for you to not get deep into the amortization table. So as the Burr strategy, it's highly encouraged to get into, and really that's the only way to pay them off is to get deep into that amortization table. So the first three years though, before they renew, does that is it still so you got it? You got to start somewhere, right? You got to get the loan. You got to get your money back, or else there is no burr. The whole the whole thing is is like I want to use the same bucket of like three or four hundred thousand dollars to go buy two or three houses at a time, get them rehabbed, and then take all that money out. So at closing, whenever I get that money out, again, our goal is zero, but really it's 
1500 or less. Like that's the realistic number. The goal is zero, but we know if it's 1200, 800, whatever we, we want, it's great. Because what happens is at closing, the lender that lent us that 75 in that scenario, they get the 75 back plus interest. So in some scenarios, we'll pay monthly interest. Some scenarios, we'll pay it on the back end. And really, we kind of give our lenders, this is a good little nugget too, we kind of give our lenders the option. Some of our lenders like that monthly stream of, of income. Others, they don't necessarily need it. So what we offer, we actually offer them a higher rate to, to backload it. So we'll say we'll pay 10% all day. You're going to get paid at the end of the month, right? Or we'll pay 12% but all of it's coming at closing. It's all in the rears. So they give us 75. We give them 75 back plus the 12% prorated daily for however many days we had bought. Nice. It. All right. So then uh, you're paying them down in like 12 years. That's your goal. After we get to 150, yes. The goal would then be to take take the cash flow, like two thirds of it, and just pay down one at a time. Kind of use the. Um, oh, I forget the guy's name. You know, he's always talking about hit the biggest debts first. Uh, um, Ramsey, David. Ramsey, Ramsey. So ours is ours wouldn't necessarily be based on the highest amount of money owed. Instead, it would be based on the highest interest rate that we're paying to get okay. that farther along into the process. Yeah. So our pay down schedule and, and the curve. So like the curve, you know, for for the amount of um, principal is like a hockey stick. I gotta get my, high, my hand higher. Yeah, it's gonna go like that. And then the curve for your equity is the exact is the exact opposite. It's gonna slowly go down, but then towards year. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it dips real deep. So you got it. Now, this is a long-term game. You know, like sure. we're not necessarily making anything on these um, that come in. However, the goal is 300 a month in cash flow. So already, you know, once we get to 30, that's 9,000 a month. And, um, you know, we're using that to basically at this point fund our marketing for our wholesale business. So that's cool too, you know. But well, That's really um, cool. Yeah, once we get to 150, that'll be about 45,000 if my memory serves me correctly at 300 a piece. And then essentially, you know, every 2 months we would pay a property off. Oh, that's that's, that's if we don't take any. So what the goal was to basically say put, you know, a half to 2 third of that towards pay down so we can still have some income off of it. It slows it down a little bit, but the fact that we're making these massive payments down the road speeds up the process. So we're not basically we're trying to cut the 20 into 12 is what we're doing. Nice. So you're getting a little bit of cash flow from these, which is funding the marketing pretty much of your wholesaling strategy so you can get more deals. Mm -hmm. um, that's cool. What, yeah, we, uh, so what's paying the bills? Is it the wholesaling fees that you're getting? Yeah. So, so like I was saying earlier, we've scaled back a little bit, uh, but not much. I mean, we're still doing, I'd say, six to eight wholesales a month um, on the low end. We, you know, we've had maybe two months in the last year that we did over 10. So I mean, we're kind of hovering six, eight, you know, 10 deals a month. Um, the more deals that we do a month, for whatever reason, the spreads on average seem to be lower. I don't know why that is. Maybe we're just giving less attention to them because we're working harder on all the other things. But on the months that we may only have, you know, five or six, for whatever reason, those spreads seem to be higher. I don't know if that's... What's your average range or spread of wholesale fees? The average is about $7,500. Nice. Which is relatively low for a lot of other markets out there. I think it's just because, you know, we're not wholesaling houses that are, typically we do, but we're not wholesaling houses that are $450,000. We're wholesaling houses that are $45,000. So it's very difficult to sell that house you know, with a spread that's going to bring in a 25K. And it happens. We've done it. We've actually done three deals in the last probably 15 to 18 months, over 80 grand in wholesale fees. Nice. So, Do you remember I mean, when you were first getting started, people telling you the average wholesale profit, three grand, maybe five if you're really good or- Or just that it's to, illegal. Or it's illegal. <laughs> yes. They're trying to pull you down saying you can't do right. it. Remember oh, yeah. I still hear it all the time. All the time. I, you know, I tell people all the time, go to local real estate clubs, but I always have to give a warning because you're going to hear it. That's where the doubters and the naysayers are that tell you you can't do it or mm -hmm. you can't make more than $5,000 on an average deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when, you know, Rick Hein. Oh, yeah. When we first started working together, he was happy to get $1,000 on a deal. Right? <laughs> yeah, like, that's, that's a big deal. It's a good mindset to have though, man. It is. It you is. Know? But I kept on pushing him. Okay, you know, 
let's try to get 2,000 the next one, and then 3,000. So we slowly got up to where, on average, we were making about seven or eight grand on a mm -hmm. deal. And then we had to split ways as friends. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that when you're first getting started, uh, I'm always trying to push people like, you know, expect more, ask for more. Because if you don't ask for it, if you don't expect it, you're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. um, no, you're absolutely that's, right. The that's, first couple you'll deals You still won't I turn did. away the... You still won't turn away the three thousand dollar deals, right? You know Absolutely. I mean? And Joe, that reminds me the first, the first uh, wholesale deal I did was a joint. This is a good story. I'll make it quick. So you know Justin Van Ripper here in in, yeah. in St. Louis. I've heard of him. If you don't know him, he's yeah, yeah. a great, great guy. So he had been wholesaling for I don't know, maybe one or two years, maybe hopefully longer than that before I had started, and I had been networking and calling property management companies like we had mentioned and one of the property managers called me and said hey I got a seller I think the guy lived on the east coast can't remember where but it was nowhere near St. Louis Missouri and he had three properties and all three of them were vacant they all three needed repairs and he didn't want to spend the money to get them back up to you know occupancy ready to get them rented again so you know, I was brand new to wholesaling. You were helping me get started. And I made them just a stupid, ridiculously low offer on all three of these properties. But I had sent them over in individual contracts. So I start marketing these. And I think I was marketing them um, at the time. Facebook didn't have the marketplace. It was like Craigslist. Yeah. And my buyers list had like 30 people on it at the time, which is, which is fine. You don't need a huge one if you've got good people on that list. And Justin reached out to me. And the, the funny part about the story is I didn't tell him the AB pricing. He just reached out and said, hey, I just sold a couple like in that neighborhood or even on that street to this guy and he's looking for more. Um, he's an out of town guy, but you know, they're, they, they pay more than most people would. And I said, I don't care what, who they are. Let's do this deal together because I wanted to get my feet wet. And he sends me over um, the BC with the joint venture and it had a $24,000 markup for two properties. So we each made 12 grand on that very first deal. Those and of you who don't know what David's talking about, the A to B is mm -hmm. the contract with him and the seller and the B to C is the contract with the end buyer. Right. I think I had them under contract at 15 a piece and then what's 12 on 12 and 15? That's their 28? 27. 27. So I, we, we had them sold at 27, but I had them purchased at 15, but there's two of them. So there was 12 plus 12, that's 24,000 gross profit. And you and split course, that 50, 50 with Yeah, Justin. so we each made like 11.5 because of closing and miscellaneous fees and whatnot. But that was the first deal that I had done and I didn't even sell it, I had joint venture. So, I you know, love joint ventures. That's, I do that's too. That's one of the best ways to get started. Some of you listening to this podcast right now are in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. You're finding deals. You need to look up David. Give him a call when you got a deal. He'll either buy it or he'll partner with you on it. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, when, when, when we were traveling a lot in Europe and with our RV, that's exactly what I was doing. I was going out and finding other wholesalers to partner with in markets. And I would do the marketing. I'd pre-screen the leads. I'd pay for all the marketing. And then split the deals with them 50-50. And uh, you, you may think, well, why would I want to split the deal? But I'm telling you, David would not have been able to sell that property that high to that end. Yeah, buyer. I probably could have sold them for like 18 or 19. Yeah. But not 27. No way. You know? So, I made more by partnering with him than if I would have sold both of them. That's assuming I had sold both of them, you know, at what I had expected to do. So, it was great. So yeah, joint it. ventures are huge. Joe, last year we 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 sold twenty three properties for joint venture partners. We did really? ninety. So in twenty eighteen, we did ninety eight wholesales. Now that's not. I know a lot of people out there say they count the transaction A B and B C. No, no, no. That was that we we bought ninety eight houses. We didn't are even, you serious? People yeah, do that? Yeah. Oh, a lot of people do. They'll be like, oh, we did four hundred and twenty seven transactions. So you did 200 deals? Okay, I got it. Like it's, yeah, just <laughs> clarify. Whenever somebody asks you that, clarify. Is that transactions? I, never, I mean, if, if that's the case, yeah, two, I did 200 transactions last year. But well, realtors, that way. that's a stupid game too where they say, we sold $50 million in property. I, I, same thing. It's like, okay, well, you could have sold one property worth $50 million. Like, what's <laughs> what the difference? That? Right. So, but yeah. I, well, JV partnering, that's so good. And it's, it's something that um, anybody listening to this really needs to pay attention on. 
you need to get rid of the scarcity mentality, this mindset of like, um, I can't partner with other, I, you're looking at other wholesalers in your market as competition. You need to look at them as potential JV partners. I've done lots of deals with JV partners. Guys like, oh, I just didn't, want to, in drive, the, in I didn't want to drive 30, 45 minutes to go look at this house, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew somebody else that had good buyers already, mm -hmm. was already familiar. All I had to do was give him an address and he would picture the house in his head. Mm -hmm. I partner with him because I know he can get it done fast. Sure. It's just everybody wins. Everybody wins. So Joe, we've actually, so we've, we took it one step farther and we, um, we use a podio form. All right. And then we just bought a domain. Let's coho sale.com. So if you're in St. Louis, let me know. I can help you sell deals all day. I did 23 of them for other people in 2018. I already a couple this year too. So, um, Let's coho sale.com. It just forwards in mass to a podio form. And what we've done to kind of, you know, entice people is typically like you just said, it's 50, 50 split, right? That's fair. Well, we've kind of upped it a little bit and said, Hey, we'll let you keep 60%. Wow. You know, you have to bring us the contract. If, if, it, if you don't have the contract and we have to go do work, we're going to obviously charge more. But if you bring us a contract, we will do all the marketing and closing coordination for 40%. So it kind of entices people to bring that to us. But where I was really going with that is I'm not plugging my site by all means, um, is that other people across the country have reached out to me to mimic what I'm doing because I've talked about doing 23 deals in a single year without having to talk to 23 sellers or really 230 sellers to without get spending any money to 20. Right, exactly. Now again, I'm taking a smaller piece of the pie but we already have the systems in place, you know, so. But there's more pies. That you there's more pies. Way. Absolutely. hundred percent. One, one of my um, original coaches, Steve Cook, I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. um, from, I know of him. I never met Steve, but I know of him. He's Sean's old partner. Yes. From, mm -hmm. uh, ba he was in Baltimore. Now he's in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said early on, I remember so vividly was like, you know, everybody at the RIA meetings are passing out business cards that says, I'll give you $500 per referral right? You refer me a deal, I'll give you. Yeah, minutes. everyone like on the back of their cards or whatnot. Yep. Mm -hmm. What if you just stood up at a, your next local RIA meeting and said, guys, I'll pay you $10,000 for every deal you bring to me or $5,000 for every deal you bring to me, right? Mm -hmm. because if you have buyers already, you, it, it would be a good idea to have buyers, right? But right, like, right. You could start advertising these insane. Now, it depends on the deal, right? You can look at the deal and say, yeah, that's not going to work, but I'll split with you 50-50 or 60-40. And that's just a great way to get out there and start doing more deals. One of the things that we did related to this. Or just to help build confidence if you're new to just do oh, yeah. your first deal or your first couple deals. Because that's the thing. Like Justin was great. I love that guy. He's a friend of mine at this point. We still, you know, do deals and I bought some houses off him in the last couple months. But really like him kind of walking me through what happens after yeah. the contract comes over, which is like the simplest part. But if you're new, you're like, what's next? What's next? And just, you know, building your own um, confidence. Well, you're finding the resources. With people. You're right. You're seeing who, the, who are the title companies, right? Who are the hard money lenders? You don't you know, know, right? And property managers, they mm -hmm. can help you with these. Uh, I, I remember when we were, when Rick and I were working, we were doing a ton of seller marketing and kind of getting frustrated with the results. This is before I got quote unquote competitive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we just started focusing on finding buyers. We built a really great database of buyers. Mm -hmm. and then we would started going around and Rick was so good at this. He's still doing this today. We still years. sell deals to Rick. Oh, you know what he we does? We haven't sold one to him in a couple months, but we've, we, I probably, I mean, my company, not me personally, but yeah. house sold easy properties. We probably sold 15 houses to Rick. Mm -hmm. Rick, all he does is he finds the buyers and I help him do this sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he, goes, he spreads the word around. Hey, I'm looking for deals. Mm -hmm. I got a, a $5 million burning a hole in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I need some deals. This is what I'm looking for. And so we started doing that in 2012, 2013, mm -hmm. 2014. And all of a sudden people started bringing us their deals. We didn't have to do any more seller marketing. He's he the joint venture king. Deals. Yeah, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. he's, no, he does really, get really his well. license. So I think he... Some, every deal is different, but sometimes he does it as a realtor. Sometimes he does it as a, as sure. a ceiling deal or something. Sure. Yeah, and I know, and, and I, like, I like Rick a lot. He's a great guy, but I respect him because he, he doesn't necessarily, his spreads are kind of fixed. 
And I don't want to get into that on, on this. However, they're fixed. So like his numbers are real easy. And oftentimes he can say, if you can get to this number, we can do it. I'm not trying to haggle you. Yeah. And then he'll be like, here's where I'm going to, what I'm going to do with it. It'll tell me. Yeah. And then at that point, it's like, all right, can I even go there? Can I negotiate down to get there? Or do I need to just cut my spread to get there? How do I get it done? You know? And you know, and he's telling you the truth, right? I, 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 yeah. I don't have a, a doubt in my mind. Right. He's not trying to take advantage of you. He's, he's concerned about his reputation. Mm-hmm. He's concerned about integrity. And, and why are we telling you guys this? Because it matters. Like it you've does. got to do what you say, say what you do. Don't try to take advantage of people. Um, and, and, and the, it's a small community mm-hmm. in St. Louis, in your city where you're at. Like everybody knows everybody. If you're that right. guy who takes advantage of them, you know, or fights for every last penny and nickel, um, people aren't going to bring you deals. People aren't going to bring you deals. Absolutely. So how I met Rick was actually a really good story. I was just starting to wholesale. I hadn't worked with you yet. And um, I, I had bought another course from a guy and, and he was all about joint venturing um, with other wholesalers if you're new and just essentially try to help market the property for them, right? So I did that with Rick. I reached out to him. He had a property in, in Kirkwood, which is the south uh, suburb of St. Louis. And I reached out to him and I told, I, this is how the conversation went. Rick, I have never done a wholesale deal. <laughs> However, I want to try to help you sell it. So like, there's no risk, right? And I'm going to mark it up two grand or 1500, like not enough to, to really make a huge impact on it, you know? But if I can bring you asking price or close to it, can I get your permission to market that deal for you? And he was like, great, send me a joint venture. I didn't even know what that was. I Googled joint venture and I'm like, cool, I'll have one over to you in an hour. And he was just, you know, so cool because yeah. I presented it to him like, I want to help. And, you know, if I can make money on top, that's what I'll keep. If I don't and I can just connect you with somebody, maybe I'll learn something along the way. So, again, I didn't have that scarcity mindset from the get-go, but I think that's a, a huge that, thing. This, for this is such good advice for beginners out there, even if you're already doing deals, but, like, such good advice. But for, you have to ask the person, and you – I didn't mean to interrupt you, Joe. Yeah. You have to ask them, and you need to – get something in writing because it happens all the time where, and it doesn't bother me, um, but other people will take our, and we started watermarking our photos because of, people would take your deal and then market it and try to find a buyer. And then when they got the buyer, then they open up the conversation of, are you willing to JV with me? No, 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 no. Do not do it that way. Talk to the person first because you have no equitable interest. For one, that's illegal. You shouldn't be marketing a property you have no equitable interest in. So you yeah. want to talk to that person. And ideally, you want to have something in writing. You know, verbal, eh, if you're friends, maybe. But you're, you may need to get it in writing later, so just do it from the get-go. Yeah, that's, that's my really two cents on it. You, you mm-hmm. got to have some equitable interest. There's got to be some paperwork and contracts involved. Mm-hmm. Hey, Joe, Especially, can I mention – or go ahead, please. Yeah. please. No, no. no. I was just going to mention. So I, was, uh, I went to an event uh, a month ago in Dallas, the Wholesaling Elite Live. Uh, yeah. Another St. Louis uh, local here, Christina, I always want to call her Aguilera, Spells is her new yes. last name. She was one of the people that spoke and I wanted to go support did she her. Really? But she did. Yeah, she spoke. And I wanted, not only did I want to support Christina because I've sold her houses and she's a great buyer of mine, but I also, I, you pick up little things along the way. You know, I didn't necessarily need to go, but I wanted to go. So I went and, you know, it's 95% of the room of people that, you know, have done no deals or let, let's say less than five, right? And we did some breakout sessions and everybody had questions about building their buyers list. And, and for whatever reason, it just blew me away, but nobody was focusing on in, these, in this breakout that I was in. And there's 100 people in this room. It was a big room, maybe, maybe 200. Everyone was worried about the buyers and focusing on the buyers first. And I kind of had to interrupt, but the speaker was like grateful for it because I was like, you all need to stop worrying about the buyer's list because if you have it, and you know this, if you have a deal, it's easy to sell, right? If you have a bunch of buyers and no deals that you're not, it doesn't do you any good, right? So then people were like, okay, well, that's fine. We'll focus our efforts on, on, you know, finding these motivated sellers, but then what? And I was like, Facebook marketplace, Facebook groups, right? So, the point of this is why I wanted to mention this is anyone that's new that's listening or watching this video right now, 
always focus your efforts. You, you want to build your buyers list. I'm not discounting that. So don't get the wrong impression. But you want to focus your efforts on the motivated sellers because in my market, for example, in St. Louis, right, we have 12,000 buyers on our list. However, I'm also a buyer, right? And I'm in all these local Facebook groups and I look on the Facebook marketplace, all right? So, you know, let's say that there's five groups in your local market and each group has between 500 and 2,500 people in it, right? Well, those same people are on my buyers list, right? But if I didn't have a buyers list, like if it, if it vanished from the face of the earth tomorrow, I wouldn't be that stressed out. I could just rebuild it overnight or over a couple of weeks. But I would, I, we always take all of our deals to the Facebook marketplace because those same people yeah. are in those, are, they're there looking for them. It's great yeah. when you can serve them the deal versus them have to go hunt for it, obviously. But in the beginning, just don't stress about that. Those people are yeah. looking for deals. So, you also got all of the other wholesalers you can partner with. And partner with, right. So I didn't mean to just sidetrack there, no, but that, that's, that's such valuable advice because everyone's always so like, you know, again, it brings analysis paralysis. Just get out there and find a deal. Facebook Marketplace, I mean, it probably hasn't like already immediately destroyed Craigslist, but I mean, it's it close. is crushing it though. I know. You know I that's where we it. used to go, yeah. you know, literally 18 months ago to sell a deal that none of the buyers wanted. How else do you get it out there? You had to market it, right? Well, with Facebook, you know, it's, it's the easiest way to get it in front of people. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. One of my favorite ways to find buyers is I look at all the investors who own property in a mile, one or two mile radius. Mm -hmm. And I send them a handwritten letter and we crumple it up and fold it out. <laughs> it works like crazy. That's and this awesome. letter, is, it pretends to be a desperate, motivated seller. Like help, urgent, a handwritten, bold, yeah. underlined. I've got to sell this property right now. I've been trying to sell it. I can't. I'm, I, I'm super desperate. The taxes are paid. The title is cleared. Take a drive by. Call me. I need this thing sold today. Underline, right? Send that out. I get 15, 25% response rate. That's awesome. That letter. Mm -hmm. And it's different, you know, but that's a great way to get on the phone. The other thing I was thinking about was you were talking about networking with property managers. Uh, guess what else? Those property managers probably know some other people that are looking to buy some more deals too, right? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Always be asking people, hey, are you looking to buy something? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's one guy in St. Louis and I can wish, I wish I could remember who it is. I always forget. Um, and I heard this story from Sean McCloskey. Or maybe it was Buttram. Um, but anyway, it was uh, this guy, he, he's, uh, he, he comes out of his uh, man cave every couple, three months whenever he's needs some money. And uh, he has a big Rolodex of all of the players, investors, wholesalers, uh, realtors, and stuff like that, property managers. And he just goes to that list and asks them two questions. Um, what do you have? What do you need? Or do you have any needs? Like, or, well, no, actually one of them is, do you have any houses you're looking to sell? Mm -hmm. looking to buy something. And if not, do you have any houses you're looking to buy? And with just That's those it. two questions. And if you got 50 people on the list, you're going to, you can make a deal right there. You can find, you're going to find someone that's got a house to sell. Somebody else that has a house they want to buy mm -hmm. and you can put them together. It's, we complicate this, don't we, David? We do. We, everyone does, you know, it's just kind of the nature of the human being to think that it, so like, you know, I, I love, you may have taught me this, but like this business is so simple. It's not necessarily easy. Okay. Those are two different things, right? The more you do it, the easier it gets. But the business in general is so simple. Find a motivated seller, find a cash buyer, get them at the title company at the same time. That's it. That's all there is to it. And everyone wants to overcomplicate it. hundred percent, Joe. I love that. Everybody, well, wholesaling is easy. Wholesalers are difficult. There you go. That's and, another and way to word it. We're always trying to be different, trying to find something. I'm looking at my post-it note here. I wrote this down the other day. I was talking to somebody mm -hmm. and I said, don't worry about being different. Be consistent and there you um, go. Yep. Just do what works. If you hear us talking about this and think, oh man, that's old stuff. I, I know that already, but are you doing it? Right. It's not that hard. If go back to the scorecard. How many sellers have you talked to in the last week? How many offers have you made? in the last week. So I went on an appointment um, just the other day. This is probably, probably about a month ago, maybe three weeks. And um, this, the guy was asking like 45 grand for this property. 
And I literally offered him like 12, right? So it was less than half, okay? And he just called me back the other day and was like, can you go to 15, right? So the lesson here is just because your offer is embarrassing, don't be embarrassed by it. And, And make it. Don't just, like, I verbally told him, and then I got in my car, and I have my podio is like podio on steroids, so, like, I can send offers via right signature from my cell phone, from Podio, and if they get signed, they go back into Podio. So, I make it a goal before I leave, unless I have, like, back-to-back appointments and I'm crunched for time, before I leave. Now, that might be me sitting in my car, and it usually is, but I want them to have the offer right then and there because if, if I don't send it to them, the odds are I'm going to forget, and it'll never get sent. And that's one of the things you taught me, Joe, is send the offer no matter what. Send the offer. Yeah. Because here's the thing, they may not understand or, or have a practical understanding is a better way to word it of what the property's really worth. So even if your offer is 35% of what they're asking, it doesn't mean that they won't accept it later. They're probably not going to like it today. But three weeks later, when they get five other wholesalers that come out that probably say we don't want it or our offer is two grand or five grand, I had offered a reasonable number thinking I can make four or five on this. It's not a home run, but I'm still going to get it to him. I'm going to send it in, in writing. And now he has my email. So there's so many things that, you, you know, you can take advantage of or tips and tricks from that alone. Um, send the offer and make it, make it and send it. Got to do that. This is like a coaching call. Isn't it? This is coaching <laughs> it is, man. I love it. <laughs> this is yeah. like a co- I hope you guys realize the, the, the gold that David is dropping for you guys. Um, so important. By the way, David, um, mm-hmm. I, I need to show you REI Simple. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm excited. I've been. I've been seeing you post about it, Joe. I need to check it out, man. I need to check it out. I. I. I, I probably introduced you to Podio. I think. Mm-hmm. But like, I love Podio, but I'm not. It's using not it. really built for real estate investors no. necessarily or wholesalers. So I just white labeled Freedom Soft. Okay. okay? And I customized it for specifically for lease options. And so this version Sweet. that I have, um, it's just for my students that bought my course or my coaching or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, what Rob Swanson has done at FreedomSoft, I'm just, I'm just blown away. I've seen them all. Mm-hmm. And they're good too, right? You know, there's one that's, that's really big from right here in St. Louis. There's, there's are friends of mine. Like I, I give right. them a hard time. I, 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 I love the competing CRMs, you know, because they mm-hmm. all keep on getting better and better. But what this thing does, it's, it's just amazing. So soon, someday soon, maybe over. Yeah. Five, I want to check it out. Absolutely. So, so it's speaking of CRMs, that's a big question that people have. So we use two, which is kind of crazy. We do use REI black book, which is, I believe what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah. Now they're a St. Louis company. Damon's a personal friend of both Joey and, my, and myself. Um, so we use them, but we use them not for the CRM. So I'm not going to say anything negative. It's a great company and a great product, but Podio just works better for us. And I've sat down with them and explained why to try to help them, of course, um, at their request. And, um, but we use REI black book cause it's a marketing beast, yeah. it creates websites. It has the property profiles that you can have on individual sites or on one master site. And it's very easy to manage. So we use the, them, but we don't keep any notes in there. That's all done via Podio because they have, you know, an app. It's yeah. easy to hook people into it, you know, all that type of good stuff. So we actually use two. We pay for two. I'd love to, you know, get away from having that, but at the same time, it's for different purposes. So maybe not. So REI Black Book is a CRM, but we just don't use it for a CRM. We yeah. use it more for a marketing machine. Well, at least you use something. I right. remember my coach when I was getting started saying, Use a database. And I was like, eh, I don't want to. Right. I more important things to do. But what a mistake that was. Like until I started using a database, the leads were falling through the cracks. Yeah. I wasn't yep. following up with people. I tell them I'd send them an offer and I just never did. Right. Like three days. I'm looking at my notes. That's why I have that rule, Joe. Send it yeah. before you leave. That's so good. Unless you don't know and you need to do more dil- due diligence, well, of course, that's fine. Right. But if you know it's low, again, you want it to be ridiculously low. If anything, <laughs> if anything, Voxer your VA. Right, and have right? them do okay. it. Please go ahead and send an offer to this seller for 45K. Boom, and, and then it, the VA does it. It's not that hard. It's not rocket science. You don't have to have a fancy CRM for that either. Right. Get a VA from the Philippines, get her on Voxer, 
or WhatsApp or whatever you're using. And, and, uh, Love that idea. And, doing um, that. Uh, the, uh, in fact, I tell people all the time, you show me an expert on Podio and I'll show you a broke wholesaler. Right. If you're spending all this time behind your computer doing this stuff yourself, you're not focusing on your highest revenue generating activities. Which is making Talking offers. Sellers, making right. offers, meeting with sellers, following up with buyers, working with your private lenders. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's do this. Uh, let's talk about marketing real quick because we're sure. running out of time. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you find working really well right now for marketing? For so, Joe, we've been on the radio. I don't know if you've heard me or not. I have a commercial on the radio. Really? I've been on for nine weeks now, I believe, nine or ten. We started off um, on two stations, 102.5 and 198, which are a little bit more female-dominated, about 65% female. Mm-hmm. However, they own ho- the, the ownership of the homes – and that's on those two stations was like 65% and they had a little bit. So there's a couple factors that you want to look at, but you want to look at if they own a home, you want to look at um, their age. And then you also want to look at income because certain stations will have young people with no income. And they typically aren't going to own a home. And then we recently just did what's called station rotation where you do like two months on this station and then you do two months on this station because people will hear your message and it'll yeah. start to kind of expire or whatnot. So we just switched. Um, this is week two and now we're on um, KMOX yeah. 1120 and then 97.1 FM news. So we're just kind of moving them around. So we're doing that. Um, wow. The results. Is it, working? it is, but it, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because like the first couple days you're on, you get a flood of calls. And then it really slows down. And then after they hear that commercial five, seven, 20 times, whatever it is, then it starts to slowly go back up. So it does have a diminishing return, but it has a weird wave before it gets there. And that's why the station rotations is, you know, is recommended. But um, I like that. And I actually hired a, a, a coach to help me, you know, get on the radio and get some good, you know, negotiate good pricing, which took me six months to really? negotiate. It's not something you can just go in and do right away because there's a strategy. We don't have time to get into that right now, but there's like a strategy that you can use to get really, really good pricing. And ideally, I would do nothing but that. And the reason is, is there's a lot of management that goes into buying those lists and skip tracing those lists and then cold calling those lists or mailing those lists. And I'm great at buying lists and mailing them, but what I'm terrible at is mailing them a second in a third, in a fourth time, and then cleaning them as you go, which you don't have to do, but it's kind of nice that people tell you to quit, you know, mailing them yeah. or call you, whatever, right? Um, so, you know, I, ideally, I would do nothing but radio, but we do a lot. We do, we do a lot. So, we do bandit signs. We do, of course, the radio. We do some, some mail, not that much, um, because we're, again, trying to pivot out of it, right? Um, we do. Uh, Which, by the way, don't forget where you're going to go. Um, I was talking to somebody in California recently, and uh, we were talking about how they're seeing the pendulum swing the other way now, where comp, uh, direct mail is not nearly as competitive as it, as it used to be. And they're starting mm-hmm. to pour more resources now into, into direct mail. Right. Yeah, seeing a bigger return mm-hmm. uh, than they have in a long, long time. Yeah, so I don't think that we're going to abandon direct mail by any means, at least right away. But it would be kind of cool, especially once we get up over 100 rentals, like we're not necessarily going to be needing to do as much marketing. So it just, the, the goal for us was two things. One, simplify all the things that we'd have to do to just one, you know, maybe change the ad up every now and then. Um, and then two is just the management, you know, of all those, of all the campaigns that we're doing. So you know, banded science, direct mail. We do, um, we do some like, we use RVMs for follow-up. We don't really do much RVMs just cold because it's kind of spammy. Um, but we do a lot of RVMs with follow-up. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of it's networking. It's word of mouth. It's dealing, it's working with those management companies. Like I said, in 2018, we did 23 deals from other wholesalers, right? Half of them yeah. lived here. Half of them were virtual, it just stumbled across, um, you know, let's co-wholesale yeah. or, you know, whatnot. So we do a lot of things. Um, I had Brent Daniels on my podcast the other day, and he said that his, his new um, secret uh, lead source was a firefighters that are 
also real estate agents, right? So that's kind of niche, but he's like, those people know that they can make a commission off the referral. So if you can get those people to send you these leads of the fire houses, he's like, he's telling me he made like 60 grand in the last eight months off of like two firefighters, <laughs> one or two that had a real estate license. So the, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is don't go try to find that firefighter tomorrow. Just know that there's so many ways to get leads for motivated sellers. There's so yeah. many, you know, there's yeah. an infinite. So but direct mail seems to be the, the best way to get started. Of course, that's how I started. To, uh, to, tying it all back to where we started from with that mm -hmm. scorecard, right? Absolutely. I think for people to get into that and start thinking about, okay, what do I need to do every day? What, if you want to grow your business and do deals, what are the two or three things? Maybe it's one or two things that you're going to do every day consistently. That's the key word there. Consistently. Consistently, right? Like Correct. it could be maybe calling two or three property managers a day, calling two or three realtors a day. It could be going to the MLS and making offers on the mm -hmm. MLS or HUD home store, handwriting 20 letters a day, sending 20 text messages a day, whatever it is that you can do, whatever your budget and time allows you to do, track those numbers, put it on a scorecard. And when you're consistently doing that, you're going to start getting leads. You're going to start talking to sellers. Now you have more sellers to follow up with. And that's where the money really starts coming in is in those follow-up leads. It sounds so simple, but it's super powerful when you can have a scorecard that you can hold yourself accountable to or get a coach or somebody to hold you accountable to this. Absolutely. I can't agree more, Joe. So, you know, like I said, you know, we're doing six, eight, 10 deals a month. It kind of varies. I'd say eight is a good average for us. And the average duration, there's two, two things I want to point out. The average duration of our deals. Now, again, this is over a four year period. So we've got a lot of data at this point is four to six months from the time that the seller calls us or we go on an appointment, either or, to the time that we get paid. It's four to six months. Now, do we go out and one, one call close somebody and sell it two and a half weeks later? Of course, we do that a lot too. But on average, it takes four to six months. So if I take any deal in my system that has a duration of four plus months, okay, going through and looking at the follow-up sequence that we have, it's the same Every time we'll go out on an appointment, we'll follow up two or three times, you know, they're going to say, no, I'm not interested. Then they, then they usually quit answering the phone and we're leaving them voicemails or shooting them text messages. If they tell us to stop, we stop. We're not in the business to harass people. We're in the business to solve their problem, right? You know that. So, you know, we'll have, you know, usually it's, it's, it's usually 10 times that we've touched those people before we can get the deal. It's not one or two or three. On average, it's 10 plus. So follow, I mean, this business is like 50% marketing, 50% follow up. Of course, there's other things you need to do, but in my opinion, and I would think you can agree, it is massively important to follow up with these people because you're spending money to get them to call you for one. So you wanna get a return on that. So you, got, you cannot stop following up unless they tell you to quit calling, then quit calling, of course. There's a lot of follow up, right? You can do phone calls. Text messages, emails, emails, postcards mm -hmm. and letters, ringless voicemail. Door knock if you have to, you know. Door knock, put a flyer, post-it note on their door. Mm -hmm. So important. It's massively yeah. important though, but yeah. So David, you guys wrote a great book. I'm, I wish I would have brought it up here with me, but. Um, yeah, I don't think I have one in reach either, Joe. No problem though. How can they get it? So right now we just have it on Amazon. We just lowered the price to be competitive. I think it's like 16 bucks, like 15 99 um, it's called The Ultimate Guide to Wholesaling Real Estate. Pretty simple. The Ultimate Guide to Wholesaling Real Estate. It's just on Amazon at this point. Uh, we have a couple ideas of what we're going to do with it down the road, but um, we wrote the book um, for a couple reasons. One, I get a lot of people at this point that you know want to pick my brain, which is great because I picked other people's brains when I was getting started, like it's, it's part of the process. And, and that's really where RIA clubs are so important because you can do it in a setting that isn't um, rude or out of line or whatever, however you want to look at it. So at this point, when somebody says that, I say, no problem. Give me your address. I'm going to mail you my book. This is why we wrote it. It's funny. <laughs> it's going to be a profit center for us, but really it's more of like, I need to be a defender of my time, right? So I'll mail them a copy for free, right? If they're local, if they're not, you know, go on Amazon, of course. And then 
I'll say, I'll meet you for coffee one, you, once you're finished with the book. And I'll even buy the coffee. I don't care. You know, it's three bucks. But mm -hmm. I'm not meeting you until you read it. And I don't want to be rude. It's similar to what you did for me, right? Quit asking questions. Read a book. You can do it in four or five hours. But it's going to answer 98% of the questions that you have. And more then after, that. more than that. And if, you, and if you read the book and you still have questions or you want to just get together, let's go do it. But at that point, I'm not wasting my time on the basics. One of, one of my favorite books is Brilliant at the Basics, Joe. That's, that's you. I'm I need to update it. that. It's, I know. Yeah, it's, it's but and, 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 again, I'm not doing that to be rude, but it's like I can't do coffee three times a day every day of the week. You know, I, I need to focus on my business. So that was one of the things. And then also credibility. Like I'd love to start doing, you know, some speaking events and other things down the road as, as well as coaching. So it's kind of a, a, just top of the funnel, you know, to get people down to know who I am, but also help, you know, that book, it took us, it took us 18 months to write it. Yeah. You know, and um, it was I was worth skimming through it. I was blown away at how much detail and how much you gave away in the book. Um, it's, it's really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a skinny book. It's 280 pages. I'm disappointed you didn't ask me to write a forward. Oh, man, I should have. I didn't even think, man. I know. Well, the next one. Because I'm, I'm not done with this one, man. Then there will be a next one. Absolutely. We're going to write really a couple of them. Thank guys, you. go to I, – I just put a link in the Facebook group if you're watching this right now. Um, it's called The Ultimate Guide to Wholesaling Real Estate written by David Dodge and Mike Slane. That's David's business partner. Mm -hmm. Really good book. I'm blown away. It's not fluffy. You know, you're not, you're telling stories, but they're not like salesy type of stories, right? They're, they're right. Like solid, really good, giving so, examples of what they're talking so about. So Joe, you know, I'll, I'll be straightforward. You know, we spent 18 months working on it, um, but it wasn't like, you know, every day. It would be like one or two hours once a week, right? And <laughs> We have a podcast as well behind me. Discount Property Investor is our disposition yeah. brand or our coaching and, and book brand and whatnot. Um, but the moral of the story is there's like 23 or 24 chapters in the book. And the first 23 or 24 episodes of our podcast is each yeah. chapter. Not in the exact same order. We had to kind of organize them a little differently. But all those stories came from the podcast. So we took each podcast, sent it off to a transcriber, then sent it back, then we reorganized it. And then we probably spent four or 5,000 on the editing, you know, cause we had people yeah. come in and help with the editing, but all like we didn't sit down and type out any of it. It was all spoken word that then was, you know, picked and, you know, picked the very best parts of it. And that's also why it took, you know, the full 18 months. But, um, but yeah, it's jam packed, man. It's a great book. I'm looking we, we at a lot podcast. of podcast. I look at your podcast right now. It's a really good show. Discount property investor podcast. Mm -hmm. We'll Very unscripted. We like to just have fun. Yeah. You do it once a week, it looks like, right? Kind of. Yeah, we took a big break, but we're getting back in the swing of things. I got two or three in the pipeline right now. I'd love to have you on. Um, yeah. Are and you still doing entrepreneurs and drinks or whatever that was? No, no. Uh, it was fun. Jimmy and Bob are great guys. I'm still friends with both of them. They kind of split ways on their own terms. And, uh, um, yeah, and it was just kind of a – it was fun. We did probably 12, 15 episodes, but – my wife wasn't too, too happy. Fun, would you say? Yeah, it was. My wife didn't like that I was at the office until <laughs> 9 p.m. every Friday. So, <laughs> a little too much fun. The That's idea great. was good, but um, with Jimmy, yeah, he's a he's a he's a he's a maniac. I love Jimmy though. He's one of one of our good buyers. We like him. Good. All right. So the pot the, the podcast is called the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Mm -hmm. You come out with episodes once a week there. So yeah, you know, like lately we've been interviewing a lot of people and we were just talking about this the other day. Mike and I are going to start putting out some episodes with just me and him that are more content driven or like, I shouldn't say content driven, but they're more driven towards like a topic, you know, like bandit signs, for example, or direct mail or whatever. Um, but we will obviously continue to do interviews, but I think the last like 20 episodes have just been interviews. So we need, well, to, we need to bring it back to the basics. Like here's an episode the first 20. You did that's really good. How to get the ex-wife to sign. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's case correct. study, actually. That's yeah. a case study. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great episode. Guys, check that out. But essentially, I could not get this lady to respond to me. She was the ex-wife, and, and we needed her to literally sign one piece of paper, which is the marital waiver, because they hadn't been divorced yet, but they were in the process of it. Seller lived in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania, somewhere up there. 
And um, I text this lady, I mailed her letters, I left her several voice messages, and then my, my partner, Mike Selene, uh, sent her one single message on LinkedIn. And for whatever reason, you know, we, we talk about this in the past, Joe, certain people like to communicate a certain way, right? Yeah. And for whatever reason, she didn't like talking on the phone, she didn't like texting, but she liked LinkedIn for whatever reason. So Mike hit her up on there, and the very next day, he got the paper signed. And I had tried for two, three months, you know, probably called this lady 40 times. And maybe it was, I was too aggressive. And we talked about it in the episode too. But just kind of have, you know, and that's also a benefit of having help in the team. So yeah. that was a good episode. But yeah, check nice. it out, guys. Thanks for uh, plugging that, Joe. Nice, nice. Okay, so thank you so much. I really recommend the book, guys. It's 16 bucks. Um, guys sell wholesaling courses that teach the same thing for 1000 bucks. 2000 5000 yeah. right. It's kind of nuts. It's called, the, it's called The Ultimate Guide to Wholesaling Real Estate. Learn how to buy properties at a discount. You published it just a few months ago, a couple months Yeah, probably ago. two months ago or so, give or take. Mm-hmm. Good. All right. We should have coffee, David, sometime soon. Absolutely, Joe. That would be good. It was good talking to you. Likewise. Appreciate it. Hey, guys, listen, go to realestateinvestingmastery.com or reimpodcast.com. Check out the show notes. We'll get a transcription of this podcast there. And you can even watch the video there if you want to. Uh, we're going to have the links to the books and the podcasts and things like that that we talked about. And uh, it's all there. I appreciate you guys. Leave a review on iTunes if you like the show. Go listen to David's show. Leave him a review in iTunes as well. And uh, we will see you guys later. We'll see you, Dave. Thanks again. Thank you, Joe. Later, buddy. Bye-bye.